So what I've been reflecting on a lot lately, and I thought this would be good for us because of the difficulties that we're being faced with kind of all over the place. We as uh, Franciscans and you as Third Order members out in the world, we have a grave duty to be able to respond properly to what's going on. But oftentimes, you know, you people in the world, it happens to us here in religious life too, but it's a bit easier for us, I think, because we're a bit more removed. But you people in the world have to face a lot of worldly things. And so as you face all these worldly things, you sometimes will easily, without understanding it, make compromises and things. Um, because there's this balance between supernatural and natural prudence. And we often don't understand the supernatural prudence, so we fall into the natural prudence, and we're able to justify, make excuses, and we have no one to answer to except for ourselves. So in the end, we're able to do things. What I wanted to look at now is with the culture falling apart, our families falling apart, everything's falling apart, not to be negative, that's just the way the culture is right now. It's... Um, it just means there's much more of a need for what you all are doing. But when we face that, when everything starts to fall apart and get difficult, the suffering and the difficulty, it just it, it mounts on us. Sometimes feels like it's going to break us because also a lot of you have grown up watching TV. You watch these television shows and they got the sentimental music and and, and in the end you we learn through television and our and that kind of digital uh, experience that we have on how to be disappointed or when to be disappointed or what's supposed to disappoint us and how we're supposed to react to that. We need to break all of that. We have to break all of it because our response, our response is that the pick up the cross and follow me. It's the, uh, I can't, I can't offer you anything. Um, I can't offer you any happiness in this life. The things we talked about in the, in the final day of the novena. I want to talk a little bit about that and give a small catechism on it so we understand. Um, we want to look at the horrors of suffering, the way we, that's the horror of it because of the way we respond to it, the necessity for suffering, and then um, uh, ways we can grow through suffering. It's a lot of information, but hopefully it won't be. I'll skip stuff, hopefully, to try to keep us on task. But one of the things I've been thinking about recently after talking to a good priest friend of mine who has been suffering his entire priesthood uh, for just things. He just doesn't, he's not a difficult person to get along with. His bishops just keep throwing him onto the bus and no matter what he does, he just gets in more and more hot water, though he doesn't do anything. And so he's one of those quote unquote canceled priests, but he doesn't ascribe himself to that whole movement. He actually called me and said, I think the whole canceled priest thing's odd. Um, it's odd because they're all rebelling against their bishops. This is an individual who suffered tremendously under two different bishops and has never rebelled against either of, the, either of them. Currently, he lives in his parents' basement, isn't allowed to do anything, have any public ministry. And so how does he respond? He said he wants to respond by living like a Carthusian. And his, here, here's, here's the point of it, is sometimes the innocent have to suffer and die. And if that isn't true, and we tend not to think it is, because when something bad happens to us and we're innocent, we get mad, and we start complaining, and we start fighting for our rights and things like that. But that's what our Lord did, and he said, if you don't pick up your cross and follow him, your cross and follow him, you can't have anything to do with him. Well, we... We suffer from sin. We've actually sinned. We're guilty. We're not innocent like our Lord. We're not innocent like our Lady. And our Lady died the death of a hundred martyrs, a thousand martyrs, all the martyrs. And she lived. And that was worse than dying. Our Lord uh, had to suffer for all of us in His death. And He was the, uh, the innocent of all because He was divine. We face these different things and we, we go and start complaining and give up and blame God and everything else that goes along with it. But if we think about the, the response, the true response that we need today with dealing with the world and the difficulties of the world, our response should be, because in justice sake, we're innocent. We haven't, a lot of times we haven't done something wrong according to how we're being treated. And since in that case, according to justice, we're innocent, right? That's all the more reason why we, 
being more closely conformed to our Lord through our profession of faith and through our duty now through the third order or religious life. In doing that, we've, we've now bound ourselves more closely to sharing in that bitter cup of our Lord, right? So that means we get to have that great honor of being the innocent who suffer and die to repair sin. That's what the body of Christ does. You can't have the body. You can't have the, 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 the head uh, who is Christ and we his body who are actually members of his, his body and say that we, he had to suffer for us and we don't have to do that. No, if you want, if you want to be perfect as the heavenly father is perfect, then imitations in Christ. And if imitations in Christ, then we have to suffer and die through innocence. We have to be innocent and suffer and die. And that's what, that's what I feel like we're being called to right now. And as we looked at the words of Our Lady in that last reflection at the Immaculate Conception, when we look at the words from that, we go through all these apparitions mostly. Uh, but anyways, we go through the different apparitions and we look at Our Lady just asking these young people, these young innocent children, to suffer and die. She's asking them to suffer and die for sinners. So what's the third order going to be good for? An army of people ready to suffer and die. <clears throat> the problem is we have an insatiable desire for pleasure. And that's the great obstacle we have. It's a great obstacle for our eternal salvation. And the horror of suffering, while not opposed directly to our salvation, um, is a great impediment to sanctification. So pleasure isn't wrong. Someone's going to hear this and they're going to go crazy saying, Fry Anthony said we're not supposed to have pleasure, he's a heretic. I'm not saying anything like that. Um, um, but the saints, the saints were always leery of pleasure. They're always leery of comfort. You remember I always say that relaxation is a word we just shouldn't, we just shouldn't use the thing. I mean, it, it, relaxation is equivalent to like dissipation and those who are those who are idle fall into evil that's just what happens you don't need to sit around and relax if you need a retreat take one if you need a day of recollection do it if you need to rest a little bit longer do it um, there's nothing wrong with these things but the, just the idea of just kind of I have I have the right now to kind of sit around and do nothing no you're just going to fall into sin. That's what you're going to do. This idea to build up all those, get those extra barns our Lord already gives us, and just you know, work, work, work now so you can play, play, play later. When you get older, you're just going to die in sin and go to hell. Why do you want to do that? Work until you die. I don't mean your job, but you got to have something. Get a plot of land. Do something. you got to stay active and busy and then die. You've got to get through this life to get to heaven. That's what you have to do. But it's all those maxims, those maxims of the world that just trick us. They form our minds and they make us think the wrong way. They don't make us think like Christ. They make us think like, like, uh, like what the devils would have us think like. You deserve it. You deserve it. You should just rest a little. Put it off. Sleep in. Oh, yeah, great. So it's that insatiable desire of pleasure which is the great obstacle to our eternal salvation, pleasure and comfort. The majority of souls who halt along the way to perfection do so because they have not dominated their horror of suffering. Because when suffering comes, they just turn back. That's what happens. Especially when in the, in the spiritual life, this is what we mean when we talk about when people go into the dark. We, we love reading the books and hearing about the dark night of the soul or the, the dark night of the spirit. We love to read about that and think how heroic it is. But as soon as you're pricked, as soon as the great majority are pricked, they will turn back. They'll turn back from the, the, the spiritual life because they go back to some consolation. They want, they want the, the feel-good stuff. They want, to, they want to know God's there holding them by the hand and showing them the way. All this other nonsense. Someone who is in spiritual or uh, in, in, in a spiritual, in a, the, uh, the, uh, 
the dark night of the senses or the dark night of the soul, if someone's in either of these, they feel like they've been abandoned by God and they're going to die. That's what they feel like. Every day just feels like death, but they have hope because it's a, it's, a, it's a supernatural good thing. Desolation and despair, desolation is still something where God's punishing you, where you feel that death, you feel that kind of depression, though it's not depression, but you're being punished because of your negligence in the spiritual life. This is what hits most people. And then you're just going to start thinking, I'm in the dark night. I'm in the dark night. No, you're not in the dark night. It's because you've been running around. You've been looking at your phone. You've been, you've been doing other things. Your dissipation. You're, you're not doing the spiritual things you're supposed to be doing. And so now God has withdrawn his grace a little bit to let you fall on your face so that you'll get back up and start focusing on the spiritual life again. Keeping your, your spiritual responsibilities, your duties, praying, offering your heart and your mind to him, being diligent. So when the suffering comes, we have such a horror of the suffering, we turn back from, the su from, from what's making us suffer and we move towards whatever's going to bring us some kind of pleasure and comfort again, some kind of um, um, consolation. We always want consolations. I'll tell you, consolations in the spiritual life are not necessarily good. They're, when God gives them to you, take them. But when they go away, thank him, because they just make you weaker and weaker. When you become reliant on consolations, you're not going to make it very far in the spiritual life. When, you come, when you're needy, and there's the same thing in the physical life, when you're needy for comfort, when you're needy for relaxation or, or whatever, the uh, pleasure, when you're needy for these things, you're weak and you're going to fall. If you, that's what the, the, being, being a diligent soldier is someone who can go sleep on the ground wherever they are, eat the bugs or whatever if they're in a survival situation. That's a good soldier who's going to live. But if we think about our spiritual life as soldiers, because that's what they say when we get confirmed, if we're, if we're spiritual soldiers, we have to be able to put up with anything. Like St. Paul says, no, no matter if he's in comfort or if he's in difficulty, whether he has or he has not, He's content because he has what God wants him to have. Because St. Paul was a great soldier. He who does not have the spirit for facing suffering can renounce sanctity because he will never reach it. You're not going to become holy. You're not going to become holy if you're not willing to let go of uh, all your creature comforts, all your, con all your spiritual consolations, all your desires for everything. And this is what I have to tell the men in the spiritual life all the time, or they're coming for vocation. Those who think about their, their, their vocation too much, lose it. Those who think nothing of themselves anymore except for the desire to give themselves to God will win their vocation. But vocation has everything to do with God, not ourselves. The men mess up when they're constantly focusing on me, 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 me. What's God want to do with me, me, me? And they, they lose it. They, they just they can't ever find the right direction. So we have to be able to make those heroic choices. Now some of the things I'm going to talk about here deal with the religious life, but you all have entered into religious life. You've entered into secular religious life. So when I talk about cloister, you just have to apply your daily experience, your daily duty, the things that you're, you're, you have to meet with in your families, in your jobs, and everything else. So the necessity of suffering a lot of these points have been taken from uh, Royal Marine. It's a, don't all run out and try to grab the book. You don't need all these books. You, you, you just need to listen to the conferences and focus on this stuff. You'll buy the book and you'll never look at it again because it's big, it's thick, there's a ton of stuff in it, it doesn't make any sense. Don't go get the book. So the necessity for suffering, necessary for both sanctification and for the amendment and reparation of sin. So. We need suffering because we need it to be sanctified. We need, san we need suffering because we need to repair sin. This is where when we inflict ourselves with suffering, mortification, right, penance, these are things we do willingly. We willingly do it because we've sinned. And if you don't do it, you've got to go to purgatory if you make it to purgatory, and you've got to do it in purgatory. So no matter what, you've got to do it. It's just here, it's a lot easier. In purgatory, it's like being in hell for the saved. It's like hell for the saved. 
So reparation of sin, we'll focus mo mostly on reparation of sin and not so much on the sanctification because sanctification, I think we can already understand it. You'll get, you'll see the sanctification. It, it'll get thrown in as I'm talking about it. But I'm looking at this more along the lines of our, um, our participation in the cross as third order members or as Franciscans of being able to embrace the cross for repairing all the damage that's going on right now or making reparation for it. Just look at what, what keeps happening in the church today with uh, the hierarchy and even the Pope. These things all have to be repaired. Somebody has got to repair that. I remember, I don't know if it was the same time as St. John Bosco. It was around the time of St. John Bosco. Whether or not it happened to him, I don't know. Him or, or Joseph Cafasso, who was a mentor of St. John Bosco. But around that time, there was a lot of bad stuff going on. The people were becoming riotous. That's when those, um, the Masons had kind of infiltrated the, the, that, that's the, 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 the time of the illumination, everything. They start coming into the papal states, whatever. So down where, where St. John Bosco was in Turin, there are all kinds of problems there. It's, it's more of a, there's more of a Masonic problem there. The, it was a pape, you know, those, in these, anyways. So there'd be people out partying and stuff at nighttime, whatever. And there's this old woman that would get up early in the morning. And she'd go outside and she would just pray, she'd pray Hail Marys all up and down the street. Right? You think after people party all night long in the streets, they go out and they sweep the streets. Well, she was outside just praying her rosary, walking up and down the street praying her rosary. And it was either John Bosco or, uh, uh, or Cafaso. They went over and asked, good woman, what are you doing? And she said she was repairing. She was, she was repairing all the filth. She was, she, was, she was spiritually sweeping away all the filth from the night before, from all the people on the streets just living riotously. She was out there to say her, her, her Hail Marys to clean the streets, as it were. So in a way, with our lives, we can allow ourselves, because through our consecration of the Blessed Virgin, allow to let the, the hand of God strike us. This is what Job did. The hand, of God, the hand of God struck Job. We're not asking God to strike us like Job. We're saying we're here and we're willing to be struck like Job if need be, to help repair these things, because God's good. He's not going to do anything that's going to be too much for you, ever. So in making that reparation, not just for our sins, we should do that, but also for the sins of others, because no one is willing to do it today. So it's a balance of divine, we, we, it's a balance of divine justice distributed, um, I'm sorry, disturbed by original sin and reestablished by the blood of Christ. That's what reparation is. Christ does it first. Whose merits are applied in baptism. So that was first, it was first uh, disturbed by original sin, reestablished by the blood of Christ, and applied through baptism. Then it's disturbed again by actual sin. Actual sins place the weight of uh, pleasure on the scale of justice. It's an interesting point. For every sin carries with it, some, uh, with it some pleasure or satisfaction. And that is what the sinner seeks when he commits sin, the pleasure or the satisfaction over God. That's why it's idolatry. It's always idolatry. And God uses it also as adultery. Idolatry as adultery when he talks about it with some of the prophets. Because we're choosing, we're choosing, uh, we're placing our love in that satisfaction, in that pleasure, rather than God. And this is what the sinner seeks when he commits sin. It is therefore necessary for the very nature of things that the equilibrium of divine justice be reestablished by the weight of sorrow, which is placed on, this, on other scales. So you've got the pleasure, the, the whatever, the, the, the discord that comes from breaking with God through pleasure and vice, whatever. Then we put our sorrow in the other. And through our penance and our suffering, we weigh it back out. Our reparation. We make reparation until we eliminate the other. <clears throat> the principle of reparation is Christ's passion and death applied to us by the sacraments. And as he is the head and we are his members, we cannot separate ourselves from him. Therefore, St. Paul says, this is Colossians 1.24, 
filling up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for, uh, for, his, for his body, which is the church. So we fill up in ourselves what's wanting in the sufferings of Christ. We amend these sins, which is thrown off the balance of justice through our pleasure-seeking pleasure and vice. Now that's where the innocent must suffer, what I keep saying. Because if we haven't thrown off, and I hope we haven't, we, we need to throw off mortal sin. That just needs to happen immediately. You just need to never, ever commit a mortal sin again. And it's possible. You don't ever have to do that again. There's no woe is me, I accidentally, no. Don't ever do that again. Be ready to jump into a fire ready r rather than commit a mortal sin. That's, that's possible. You all have the grace. You receive absolutely all the grace to never commit another mortal sin ever again for the rest of your life if you're diligent. You have that right now. You can start right now. So that needs to be gone. Now we need to repair all of that stuff so that you don't have to go to purgatory. But on top of that, what about everybody who's not going to repair it? Remember, Christ died not for you in the first place, but to repair uh, the, the, the damage, the offense committed against a good, loving God in the first place. We put ourselves in the first place because we're so high and mighty, but he didn't die for us first and foremost, but to amend that, that, that offense against God the Father and then for us. It's all in the same instance. But you put it in priority. God's more important. Him being offended is more important than our salvation. Because it's not necessary that we're saved. It's necessary that God's not offended. Right? It's necessary that he's appeased. But God's good and so he, 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 also, he also saves us from our sins by, by the redemption. But that we now have to make up for our own actual sins. So why don't we imitate? If we have to imitate him as we say we do as Franciscans, then we need to imitate as innocent the reparation of other people's sins. If we stop the mortal sins, 20 years from now, you still haven't committed a mortal sin. Thanks be to God. You still need to do penance and make reparation because it's our job as members of his body to be able to do a, repair all of this for their sake and to appease an offended God, right? We do it now, not as just a normal mortal man, because remember, a mortal man couldn't, he, they couldn't redeem us. Adam could not redeem us. If he did, he redeemed himself. If, if Eve, she redeemed herself. There was nobody who could redeem all of mankind except the universal man. That is God incarnate. He could redeem all men because he was God incarnate. By, by, by God becoming a man, he took on an um, infinite value. So he could pay back at an infinite price to God the Father. Now remember the words that Our Lady asked the children at Fatima. So in thinking about this, do you wish to offer yourselves to God to endure all the sufferings that he may choose to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended. Now, he wasn't talking about their sins. He just, he already said, Lucia and Jacinta were going to go to heaven. Now, Francesco had to pray a bunch of rosaries, but he too was going to go to heaven if he prayed all those rosaries, and he did. So whose sins? That's the time of communism. That's the time of masonry. That's the time the, the war is getting ready to start up again. There was a war already going on, and there's another war getting ready to start. There, he, she already foresaw what was going to be happening in the church from the 60s on. I mean, because it, it was supposed to be published in the 60s. Whatever, I don't know about all that stuff. And ask for the conversion of sinners. So I'll read it again. Do you wish to offer yourselves to God? to endure all the sufferings that he may choose to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he has offended and to ask for the conversion of sinners? And they all responded, yes. Then, she said, you will have much to suffer, 
but the grace of God will assist you and to always bear you up. The grace of God will assist you and always bear you up. When they dropped the, the atomic bomb, well, there's a lot of Catholics in that city in Hiroshima, they say, and there's an instance of this, because you know there's Jesuits, uh, there's that Jesuit house that one, one of the members inside the Jesuit house, he got, pretty, he got injured pretty badly, but he survived it. The rest of them weren't hurt at all. It just blew out the windows. It was the only building standing. And afterwards, um, they had spy planes going over, and they saw these Jesuits just walking down the street, and like, everything's completely decimated. Well, they, later on, they, there was a, I, I can't remember how it worked, but there was a conference or something like that, and they are talking to one of these priests who had survived it and everything. And they were asking him about the, the people there, and he had a very interesting take. He said the morality, they found that the morality of the people who survived the dropping of the bomb was higher after the bomb dropped than before it. Why? As a people, they had a very noble souls, whether Christian or non, but there were a lot of Christians there in that town too, and they offered themselves as victims to stop the evil of the war. They saw by that bomb, they believed by that bomb dropping on, now this is probably disputed by some people, but we'll look at it through the eyes of the, the Japanese that were on the ground. They saw it, that the dropping of that bomb ended the war. They saw that they could take the brunt of that suffering to end the horrors of that war. And so they saw it as an honor. And their morale lifted. They had a higher morality after having everything in their lives decimated because they were able to be victims that, 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 that served a greater good. And that on a natural level for many of them. Our Lady gives birth to us in pain. And our consecration, um, we allow ourselves, we allow ourselves, uh, let's see, what's this thing doing here? To be led by her to Calvary. Where she stands and she weeps, as this is something we can reflect on. Where she stands and she weeps as we suffer. But will all the same, this is, this is the thing about God and Our Lady, she will all the same, she will offer us to the Father as she did her own son, who she gave birth to in joy. So she's the one that gives birth to us at Calvary in pain. Don't think it's contrary to the spiritual life that Our Lady will be taking you to Calvary where you're going to be crucified and you're going to die. This is what she does, especially if you've made your consecration to her. My whole life, my whole death, my whole eternity. Those are words we say in the consecration. To live, work, suffer, die, and be consumed just for you. Live, work, suffer, die, be consumed just for you. So ways to grow in the spiritual life. So uh, we grow in progress for thirsting for suffering. This is kind of what we need. We need to be able to grow in our ability to thirst for suffering. Now this doesn't, we don't mean this in some kind of masochistic. It's funny, when you go to a psychologist, when they send us religious to psychologists, because they make you do that a lot here in America, they made me do it here, it took a day and a half, and the whole thing was just a, a silly joke. But they make you go through the, all this weirdo stuff and one of the tests came back and said I was a, uh, I was a, um, I was a masochist with uh, schizotypal tendencies, and I had no idea what that meant. But I know masochist sounds pretty bad, and it's because you're willing to embrace suffering. It's just nutcases. What do you do? Nutcases. So afterwards, they had to bring me out the little the sheet and say, "What did you mean when you said?" that you don't think that you are unnecessary because I'm not necessary, only God's necessary. Oh, so it's like a theological thing? Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? I'm not making fun of anybody out there if you're a psychologist. I'm just saying. 
So ways to grow in progress are thirsting for suffering. And we mean this in a holy way. To never admit our duties. So we're going to go through several points. And these points are all, there's, there's degrees by which we suffer. Because you suffer, you suffer when you, when you stub your toe and you get really mad because you stubbed your toe and you've been having a bad day anyways. And then you say a bad word. I mean, this is already a suffering, but you just didn't handle it properly. You handled it actually improperly. So there's degrees in how we, we suffer. And so we want to look at those different degrees now and give a little bit of um, commentary on some of that. And I have a couple of beautiful quotes from like St. John of the Cross. So first, the first one is to never omit our duties. This is the first suffering. Never omit our, our duties because of the suffering they cause us. And oftentimes, our duties cause us suffering, and so we get mad and we stop doing that particular thing, or we don't want to see that particular person or whatever else. So despite of repugnance towards certain duties, um, we have to perform them. Because repugnance... To do things is exactly what we should want to do. Um, it's what I used to tell the kids when you're we doing marriage seraphic youth is like the ones that don't want to do clean the toilet, they should always volunteer for it because there's nothing wrong with clean the toilet. But some of the kids, you know how when you're a kid, you hate doing a particular thing that you're told to do. What we were trying to tell the kids was always pick that thing that you don't want to do because then you get stronger. You always get stronger. And then you get to a point where nothing can touch you because you're not afraid to do anything. Whatever's repugnant, whatever's, whatever's distasteful, whatever you quote unquote hate, you just do those things. And you find that you're, you, become a, you, you become impervious. You're not able to be affected anymore. Well, well you go do the toilet. Okay. You're, you're completely indifferent to it because it doesn't affect you anymore. We need to seek out those things and, 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 and willingly accept those things that are repugnant to us, especially if it's your duty. The exact fulfillment of all our duties and obligations according to our state in life is the first degree which is absolutely indispensable for the crucifixion of self. Being, being, um, being zealous in, to do what you're already supposed to do. That's the first step in accepting the, the crucifixion of self. Because you get this dialogue when you're still weak and you're still new at this stuff of convincing yourself to do something else because you deserve it. Whenever you hear that you deserve it thing, you don't deserve anything. You probably deserve the pits of hell. It's probably what you deserve. If you ever committed a mortal sin, you deserve the pits of hell. It's only by God's mercy you're not going to go there, hopefully. Uh, if you, well, if you've repented from it, you're not going to go there because you've repented. And hopefully you won't fall into it again. But we, we deserve worse. But God's good to us. He's very good to us. So we should be willing, at least in our own duties, to face what we have to face for our own crucifixion. So that's the first level. Resig the second, resignation to the crosses which God permits to send us. The car breaking down, uh, illnesses that hit us. Uh, deaths in the family. These are things that come our way and we don't have any control over it. It just comes. And because it comes, we face it. Not doing the deep breathing, the throwing the hands in the air, the why me, all the other stuff is silently and diligently facing it and offering it to God. We often say, just say, blessed be God forever and just keep going forward. There's nothing wrong with feeling feeling the, the, the disappointment, the discouragement, and the pain from difficulty that befalls you while still diligently doing what you're supposed to be doing without complaining about it. Remember Job lost his whole family. He lost the whole family. And then he got inflicted with all kinds of sores. And as, even his wife was telling him, just, just bless God and die. Basically, bless him and curse his friends were coming, doing the same thing. He just stayed diligent. He accepted those crosses as they came. Though you see in Job, he didn't ha it wasn't easy for him. It's not like he was just happy and cheery with sitting in a dung pile with ashes on his head. He wasn't, he wasn't cheery doing that. But he accepted the crosses and he endured it. We need to do the same. So this is meritorious according to the love by which... Uh, with which it is born. So when we, when we 
when we bear these difficulties, these crosses that befall us with love, that's merit. And remember, merit is the only thing you have infinite value to amass. The only Because we're finite creatures. We can't do infinite things. But love, love, that is charity, and the, the merit that comes from it is the one thing you have infinite value of achieving. Meaning, God sets no limit to it. There's no limit to the amount of love you can love because your merit in heaven is based on love. That's it. It's not based on anything else. That's what we do. We amass that. So when God gives you these difficulties, if you embrace them simply for the fact that they came from his hand and you endure it, even though you're weeping from it, don't, don't confuse the fact, you, even though you're weeping from it, um, then it's meritorious because it's, it's born with love. All these contradictions and trials, which constitute the pattern of our daily life, have a great value for sanctification if we know how to accept them with love and resignation as coming from the hand of God. Now, these are resolutions that you have to make. If you're not used to it because you get impatient when difficulty befalls you, then you make the resolution, you examine your conscience, uh, midday to make sure you're, you're still doing it, Re, you know, reform the resolution in your head so that you can try to overcome these obstacles so you can start being more resigned, more loving in, 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 the, in, in acceptance of God's hand in your life. God uses those around us. This is the one that we flee from often. This is why people move from one parish to the next constantly, huh? because they're, they're tired of this. God uses people around us in our daily life who, in good faith, usually, but not always, afflict us, offering us opportunities to grow in holiness and patience. It's the people around us. That's why you need community. That's why a parish life is formed. That's why we come to the meetings for the third order. Uh, we should be able to come to the meetings because the difficult personalities that come together it's good for us to be around people who we don't always get along with or always agree with because it gives me an opportunity to, um, to be patient with them, to exercise love towards them, to listen to somebody I don't like to listen to, um, you know, or whatever else, to be around those that I might not be all that excited to be around. It, it's because community, it wears off the rough spots. I think I have a quote here. I do. I have a quote here from St. John of the Cross. It, it'll come up. Oh, it's right here. Okay. You should, you should understand. Now, now St. John of the Cross is using this for in convent life. He's using community life. But where it says convent, I want you to apply it to your family life, to your friends, to your work situation. You should understand that you have come to the convent only in order that others may polish and exercise you. Sorry. Got misspelled the exercise. So polish, we can say, um, you know, rub off the, the rough edges or something like that is what polish would be, right? Throw you into the, the fire, uh, uh, the 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 uh, what's it what's it called? The gold and silver is uh, uh, something in fire. I don't know. So, anyways, the. Be polished and exercise you. Now remember, those of you uh, in the world, you chose it. Most of you chose it. Some of you might have wanted to go into religious life and you weren't able to do it. Uh, but then, there, there, th then that point is that you know you're you're still you know you're doing God's will now too. But those of you who willingly got married, uh, you chose to get married. And those of you who are having difficulty in your marriages, you're not alone in it. Uh, but you have community life, and community life is hard uh, because you're dealing with another individual who has their own soul and has their own mind and will and has to make, you know, they have to sanctify themselves in front of God. So you're, it's just complicated. People are complicated. So we've chosen these things. This is our convent, right? Thus, it is fitting that you should think that all, all are in the convent to test you. All in your life are there to test you as they truly are. That some have to polish you by words, others by works, others by thoughts, thoughts against you. That in all these things 
you must be subject to them as the statue is to the artist or the sculpt or the uh, who sculpts it and the painter and the painting to the painter and if you do not observe this you will never know how to conquer your own sensuality and sentimentality nor will you ever know how to conduct yourself well with the religious in the convent nor will you ever attain to holy peace nor will you ever free yourself from your many evils and defects see that it's good to be around these people who don't treat us so good sometimes because remember God can put people that are completely like-minded as us agree with us in absolutely everything and allow them to be suspicious of you and cause all kinds of problems for you right it's not necessarily something to flee I don't want to go there because that lady's there and I just hate being around her you're just trying not to be buffeted you're trying to stay in your comfort spot you don't want to have to deal with difficulty that's not good we have to learn this stuff we have a limited amount of time on earth very limited amount of time and if you don't allow yourself to be in those bad situations now what I mean by bad I don't mean a situation where they're going to be, you know, listening to bad music and telling dirty jokes. I don't mean that. I mean just being around people you don't like being around. If you're around those kind of people, then you learn how to be quiet. You learn how to accept the humiliation. Well, they always, they always take a poke at me. Yes, yeah, so what? So what? These are good things. These are good things. We need to be able to practice voluntary. This is, the, I think, the third one. In our third degree, so the first one, just to recap, not omitting our duties, being faithful to our duties. The second, being resigned and patient with all the crosses God will send us. The third, practicing voluntary mortification. So the others are passive. You got to do what you got to do. These are already yours to do. God's decided to lay certain things on you. You got to accept that. That's passive though. It just comes, you deal with it. Now we're into the active active mortification taking initiative and in spite of the repugnance which nature feels advances in the love of suffering by voluntary voluntarily practicing christian mortification in its various forms this isn't the same for all and you need to be led by inspirations now, some of you are listening to this thinking, oh, i got to start taking the discipline or start wearing a hair shirt. i got to do some kind of... We always want a one a one a one first. You need, you need to be proficient in these other things first. The, path, the, the passive are really more, more important right now. Get the passive down until your heart's burning on fire for love of God and then allow yourself to receive more mortifications. Start with food. Because food's so precious to us. We like to eat food. We think about food all the time. Where am I going to go eat next? And what am I going to have? And how am I going to get it? And hopefully they don't mess it up. And then after they did, you just complain about it. So food tends to be that. What you can always do, you can just start, and I've mentioned this before, just order things you don't like. You know, just thinking about you, you don't want to do that. No, it's my one opportunity, even though you do it a couple times a week, it's my one opportunity to go to, to this restaurant and get that steak, even though you keep doing, but get, just get something else. Get something you don't like or get it, get it served you in a way you don't like it or only go out when somebody invites you. These are mortifications. These are active mortifications. So take, it, take initiative in spite of the repugnance which nature feels, advances in the love of suffering, by voluntary practices, practicing Christian mortification in various forms. Not the same for all. You need to be led by inspiration. The closer you, the, the more, see the Holy Ghost is very real to us. If you're praying and staying close to the Holy Ghost, then, then you'll start to feel inspirations. Now, don't, don't start thinking you, everything's an inspiration now because Friar Anthony said it. Now you all these inspirations. Sometimes we like to immediately put ourselves on this like spiritual totem pole and, and think that we're, you'll, you'll know when you're being, but that's why you kind of need a spiritual director to know, am I being inspired to do something? Yes or no. Um, we need to, you know, when holiness comes, you're not going to think you're actually growing in holiness. So just anyways, when the inspiration comes, 
just allow yourself to be led by it, right? You're going to be, you're going to find that you're proficient in other things. These things are going to start coming naturally as you're striving in the spiritual life. But you should check with a spiritual director. Now, a note on the spiritual director I want to make because it's important. There's two things that can happen. One, the spiritual director might not be paying too much attention. Sometimes you get this nowadays, like you don't need to do active mortification. You need to do internal mortification because we really don't need all that kind of stuff. That's hogwash, and the saints have never said that kind of stuff. We do need internal mortification, and the reason they say it is because St. Francis de Sales says it, but he's not saying not to do external active mortification. First and foremost, the first two degrees, we have to be able to internally mortify. We need to advance in that to a degree where we start doing external active mortification. This is only the third step out of five, huh? So we still have a ways to go. We don't want to settle for mediocre, um, mediocre holiness. We want to reach the heights of holiness because that's what your duty is to do here before God. If you're supposed to imitate him, well, that's what he is, the heights of holiness. So we're supposed to do that. So this, the spiritual director is, is the, is the uh, he should guard against letting you move too rapidly into things you're not ready for, but he, he has to make sure he's not hindering you from doing what you ought to be doing. Does that make sense? So he should guard against letting souls take on too much or by limiting the soul's desire for immolating itself with Christ, which would which allows it to to fly. It, it's a, it's a, it allows the the soul to kind of take its wings and and fly. That was a, a reflection we gave a while back. There is no other way. It's a quote from the author. There is no other way to reach sanctity than that traced for us by Christ along the way of Calvary. Remember that there is no other way to reach sanctity, which is our goal, than that traced for us by Christ along the way of Calvary. Just because you get consolations in prayer doesn't mean you're becoming holy. It means you're still a baby in the spiritual life and you have to be guided by consolations. This is what it means, usually. St. Peter talks about it, um, that some, still, some, some aren't mature and have to be fed with milk. They're not ready to be, be fed with uh, the higher things. The, the real mortification is when, when the soul is becoming more and more hardened, hardened in a sense of spiritual-wise, in, in, in its duty towards God, able to imitate more faithfully the, 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 um, the image of our Lord. The fourth is this, to prefer suffering to pleasure. Now again, these are more advanced things. These next two are more advanced things. And I'm not saying them for you to immediately think that this is something you're already at or for you to start thinking that you need to advance there right away. They're, you're probably, probably most of you aren't there. You're not there. So don't start pretending. Don't allow your minds to go crazy on you. If you are there, you're not going to think that you are. So if you are thinking that you are there, it's because something might be messed up. You need to go talk to your spiritual director and see kind of what's going on. But there could be a lot of vanity in these things, and we're trying to avoid that. What we want here is catechetical information to understand the trajectory. Where are we to get to? We're to get to a desire for suffering uh, for pleasure. I'm sorry. Uh, to prefer suffering to pleasure. So rather than finding our happiness, which is what we seek all the time, and in seeking our pleasure is what we're always doing, we should be seeking to find um, that which is in instinctively um, kind of uh, abhorrent to us, what, what, what we abhor, to anything that satisfies our tastes or comforts. And the reason being is... Um, like, for example, in, in the friary, we don't have cushy beds. We don't have warm house. Uh, we don't have comfortable clothing. We don't have any of those things. But if we did have comfy beds, I would fear that I would become weak in the spiritual life because a hard bed would then become difficult for me. 
a cold house in the summer would make me would make my flesh easily pricked when I went into a hot house. A, a hot house, a warm house in the winter would make my flesh more pricked when I went into a cold house. But when you live in a cold house, you're happy when you walk into a warm one. When you live, when you sleep on a hard bed, you're I don't know. You're happy when you're not sleeping. <laughs> but the thing is, is to remember that the flesh craves these, these comforts and all of these other things. So what we have to do is chastise the flesh. Keep it ready. Keep it zealous. Keep it always focused on the end goal. Crucifixion and death in Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. That's what we need to be doing. And that's not to beat ourselves up. No, we need to take care of ourselves. We, we make sure we eat properly. And the hard bed's not bad for the body. I think it's actually quite good for it. Uh, cold weather in the friary, I think it makes you stronger. I don't think it makes you weaker. When the house is hot, I don't know what that does. Everybody tells me that's bad. But I don't find that it is in the end of the, end of the year. We get through it just like everybody else. Um, if you walk into somebody's house that has air conditioning, it's nice for a minute. But when you walk back outside, it's really hot. When you walk outside and it's really hot in your house, uh, when it's hot in your house and you walk outside, it feels sometimes cool. So what do you do? So we need to try to prefer. It's not so much finding our happiness and misery. That's not what we're trying to say here. But, but choose the opposite of what we're, you know, not seek those creature comforts, but to, to keep ourselves diligent, like, 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 um, like, like trained, alert soldiers. That's kind of what it is. The comforts can make us weaker, but the opposite can make us stronger. For the saints, when everything went badly with them and the whole world persecuted and calumniated them, they rejoiced and gave thanks to God. This is the whole point of like perfect, perfect joy of St. Francis because it conformed. The thing is, when, when everything's going wrong and we're being treated badly, it, that's more in conformity to the life of Christ than it is uh, this, this life that we live here. Where we get everything that we want, we're around people that are happy, we're always happy, everything's content, there's never any adversity in our lives. That's not the life that Christ lived. It just isn't. They rejoiced and gave thanks to God when they had these persecutions and calumnies. Though, when they had the applause of the world and the praise of men, they trembled. Over and over again, the lives of the Franciscan saints, uh, as soon as people started praising them for their, their homilies, their sermons, their good works, they fled from that community and went to another community where they could be obscure again to be lost and forgotten, but only seen by God. This is what the saints want, and this is what we should want. But you know how it is when nobody sees us, when your children forget about you, when your spouse doesn't see the good things that you're doing around the house or whatever else, or your children don't recognize the good that you do for them, all the other things, how sad you get because you don't receive human respect. The saints weren't that way. They thank God because God sees the good they did. Did you do it for your, your, your spouse, your children, your friends, or did you do it for God? And this is what we have to re, reorientate our minds for. St. John of the Cross says this. This is from the Ascent on, on Carmel. Book 1, Chapter 13. To endeavor always to incline oneself, not to that which is easier, but to that which is more difficult. Not to that which is tasty, but to that which is more bitter. Not to that which is more pleasing, but to that which is less pleasing. Not to that which give rest, but to that which demand effort. Not which is more, but which is less. Not to the lofty and precious, but to the lowly and despicable. Not to the, not to that which is uh, to be something, but to that which is to be nothing. Not to be seeking the best in temporal things, but the worst. 
and to desire to enter into all nakedness and emptiness and poverty through Christ in whatever there is in the world. They're always nice words. The, the last words there. Desiring to enter into all nakedness and emptiness and poverty through Christ and whatever there is in the world. But the first words are hard for us to hear. That which is not that which is tasty, but that which is bitter. Not that which is more, but is less. That is preferred, but is despicable. We have to, we have to, we have to reform ourselves to see the value. This is what Christ chose. This is how Christ lived. Our final one is this. And this again, I'm giving you information on. You are not to go and do this unless you have direct approval from a spiritual director, somebody who knows your soul. Don't allow vanity to make you do something that's going to, uh, you're not going to be able to handle. But to offer oneself as a victim of expiation. In essence, everything I'm saying here is that's what I'm telling you to do. But the, 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 the victim soul is for a very select few who have reached mastery. Mastery and perfection and are able to endure the, the difficulty that God's going to send them by asking for it. If you have not been led there by God to this point, you will not be able to endure what you may be asking for. There are many martyrs who didn't really have permission to go be martyrs, or they weaseled permission out of their superiors. And then when they went to be martyred, because the Franciscans would just ask to go like preach in front of the mosque, and then they'd have their heads cut off. Well, sometimes they didn't just cut your head off. They started beating you and punishing you and offering you. And some, some of these Franciscans would apostatize, right? Well, I don't know about some of them, but I know what happened to this one. And so he, he actually, uh, he apostatized. And then he went back to the friary completely humiliated. And once he got, it, he got his senses back, prayed, he was given the grace to actually go do it again. So he asked to go do it again, and he suffered martyrdom. But this is what can happen. He had the courage to go do that, but we don't always do that. So anyways, to offer oneself as a victim of expiation. It's an act more, uh, in more perfect in degree in the love of suffering. It's the, uh, the most perfect in degree for the love of suffering. It would be a terrible presumption for a beginner or an imperfect, an imperfectly purified soul to place itself in this state. You don't go and start telling God you want to suffer for the expiation of everybody unless you have that direct uh, inspiration from God and you've checked it with somebody to make sure you're not just being vain and led astray. <clears throat> There's um, a book by the author's last name is Plus, and it's um, Christ in Our Neighbor. He writes this, To be called a victim is easy. And, it's, it's, and it pleases self-love. But truly, to be victim demands a purity, a detachment from creatures, a heroism, which is abandoned uh, to all suffering, to all humiliation, to uh, ineffable obscurity, that I would consider it more foolish or miraculous if one who is at the beginning of the spiritual life should attempt to do that which the Divine Master did not do except by degrees. So we don't just enter into this unless you've been led to it already through, through uh, the, all these other degrees of sanctification uh, and suffering. The theologian, the theological basis of offering oneself as a victim of expiation for the salvation of souls or, uh, or any other supernatural motive, such as reparation for the glory of God, liberation, uh, liberating the souls in purgatory, attracting the divine mercy to the church, um, the priesthood, one's country, or a particular soul, etc., is the supernatural solidarity established by God among the members of the mystical body of Christ, whether actual or potential? It's what we said there, there at the beginning. This is a quote that I'm taking from uh, Royal Marine in his book. 
But it's what we talked about before. If, the, if that's what the, the, the essence of reparation is that Christ sheds his blood to repair the balance that was knocked off kilter by original sin, and then um, our expiation and reparation by our actual sins that create um, this, this imbalance and injustice. Um, but since, since Christ being uh, the principle of, of reparation and we being members of his body, when we enter into it, we can also fulfill, uh, help alleviate these kind of things. There's many, many souls who offered themselves for popes. Um, one's that brother Andre, I think his brother Andre up in Canada. Um, he offered himself, I think, for a couple different popes. It means that the soul, which would give itself in such a degree for the salvation of its brethren in Christ, must itself be very intimately united to him and must have traveled a great distance towards its own sanctification. It must be a soul that is well schooled in the suffering and has a veritable thirst for suffering. Under these conditions, the director could permit a soul to make this act of offering itself as, offering itself as a victim, and thus, if God accepts it, could convert it in life into a faithful reproduction of the divine martyr of Calvary. Now, that sounds nice, but let me read the last part again. If God accepts this offering, then that, that soul will be converted in, in its life into a faithful reproduction of the divine martyr of Calvary. Reproduce the sacrifice that our Lord offered. That's what you see in like uh, St. Therese, Therese Lassoux. She offered herself. And at the very end when she was dying, she said, she, she mumbled some words that maybe nobody understood. But what she said was, I don't regret this. She didn't regret offering herself, no matter how much she was suffering. Because someone who arrives at that, the suffering that comes from it, the, it, it transfers, suffering comes in and love comes back out. Because as you're suffering, you're offering that to God the Father. And that is something that is very, very meritorious. So it's very beautiful for the soul. And, and that's why she, even at that last moment when she's suffering so much, she didn't see it as like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. Because she saw herself as like a percolator of love for God through the, through the, the bubbling up of sacrifice and, and immolation that's happening in her flesh. So these last points that I've just given, they're, they're points that are to be made in understanding what it means, these degrees of suffering. But in general, I give them so that we can look at what it's needed to be for our sanctification on the, on the path of penance and mortification in accepting our crosses so that we can move in that direction towards a... Um, um, a greater holiness that, that allows us to be instrumental in correcting the ills of our day, not just through our personal um, example that we give out in the world, but also through the hidden life of prayer and suffering that we're able to offer to our Lord. Now, as I mentioned it, but in the consecration prayer that we make, we make something already a bit like this. We offer ourselves to Our Lady, and she, as a good mother, is going to be able to see where we're at. She's going to be, be able to see what we're trying to offer and what we're trying to do, and she'll help bring us up that um, through, through the, the degrees of this suffering and sacrifice so that we can be made more perfect and also more efficacious in the conversion of sinners because that's what she wants and that's what she does. So I put that out there. It's something for us to reflect on for this next month. Remember, with Christmas coming up and all the parties that you all are probably going to have to go to and everything, all the gatherings, you can, you can exercise this even at those gatherings. Don't make a spectacle of yourself. You don't go and say, oh, it's Wednesday, I can't have meat. You don't have to go tell everybody that. 
but but you can just kind of go around. You just take certain things on your plate, uh, and you can take things that you don't necessarily like. Uh, th there's mortifications you can do even at the parties, but but go and be be social if it's appropriate for you to go and um, be there and be present to your family. Uh, but even in that, you can still have the hidden life amongst the crowd, and that's what you need to do because in the hidden life, God will make you shine. You don't have to make yourself shine because you might be doing it just for vanity, and the devil will love that. So God bless you all. We'll end the reflection there. Let me just.